all things skin barrier. Um, I really appreciate you guys coming. This is my very first like real planned live um, that I've done on Instagram and I will be going live every Wednesday evening. If this is a good time for all of you, then this will be a good time for me too. So um, yeah, every Wednesday at seven, I figure it's a good time because everybody gets out of work, um, ate a little food already, um, moms maybe fed the kids already. So maybe have a second to themselves to learn all about the skin. So let's get started. We're gonna go over all things skin barrier. So the skin barrier is our, it's the most important first step to having good skin is to have a healthy skin barrier. Without a healthy skin barrier, uh, your skin will be dehydrated, it'll be problematic, sensitized, um, it will be sensitive to new products, um, and less res overall less resilient and moisturized. Our skin is our first line of de defense against the environment and pathogens. So if you can imagine, our barrier is the little um, acidic, slightly acidic layer of our above our skin. Um, sorry, it's a com <laughs> I'm so nervous. It's a complex network um, of our acid mantle and our natural moisture factors in the skin. So our acid mantle is what's slightly acidic. Um, and it is comprised of ceramides, cholesterols, fatty acids, natural moisturizing factors, and water. So if you can imagine, um, there's a lot going on. It's not as simple as it sounds. And this is why it's so crazy to me that it's so overlooked in skincare, um, in medical skincare too, in dermatology. Um, it gets looked over or treated as not as important as it really is. So, uh, glow is the essence of beauty, uh, which is, is a famous quote from Estee Lauder, and it's always stuck with me. I read it in her autobiography, and I just love it. Um, and I believe that's totally true. I mean, you can be 100 years old. Uh, if you have glow, you're going to look radiant healthy and beautiful. So basically anybody can have glow and a healthy skin barrier is going to give you that. So this is why we're gonna go into it. 99% um, of my new clients, by the way, uh, when they walk in through my doors and I see them for the first time, 99% tend to have a compromised barrier. And this is due to a lot of different reasons. The main reason I see is from products that they're using, um, not to, to poo poo on other brands or anything. It's not necessarily one brand. It's just not the right products that are going to be the most supportive for their skin barrier. And the other problem is, is a lot of products are being marketed as for the skin barrier. Hey, Damita. <laughs> um, a lot of products that are marketed as for the skin barrier actually disrupt it. So um, that's why I feel I'm on a mission to break it down what your skin barrier is and what it needs to be healthy. So um, ceramides, cholesterol, fatty acids, water. Um, what are ceramides? So ceramides are like the mortar in between bricks that hold them together. Our ceramides in our skin is that mortar and the bricks are our skin cells. So they are holding together our skin, our skin basically, um, and processes are communicated through ceramides and they hold in moisture. And the problem is, is as we age, we have a harder time to produce ceramides naturally, and our ceramides have a harder time working as good as they used to. Um, so it's important as we age to take more and more care. That's why when we're younger, you can be a little bit, well, you can still absolutely disrupt your skin barrier, but you have 
very youthful cells. You have an abundance of ceramides. So you can get away with a little more. And I say, isn't that true for like everything? <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you let your skin barrier go, it can aggravate certain inflammatory processes and even diseases of the skin like atopic dermatitis, which is basically a broad term for a skin reaction. So again, you will be more sensitized. Your skin will have a harder time to hold in moisture. And therefore, in the end, it'll have a harder time to protect itself. And we want it to protect itself because it is our first line of defense. So couple other causes besides uh, other skincare products that are not recommended. Um, I would say there's health conditions, which you can't really do a whole lot about. So um, if you have a compromised barrier due to a health condition, we can still support your barrier through products and nutrition. So, you know, you'll still run on the drier side or a more impaired side, but we can create a system of more support so that it doesn't get as messed up. And it's, it's basically we're helping it as much as possible. Um, certain medications can disrupt the skin barrier too. Um, even products that are intended for anti-aging that are super popular and amazing. Um, even products that I recommend. So like retinoids, acids, um, some vitamin C's, they actually dis disrupt the skin barrier because believe it or not, our skin is designed to keep things out. It's really hard to penetrate stuff in. So that's why it's funny when um, in a lot of green living circles, you know, they say to use non-toxic beauty. The, most beauty is non-toxic. There's a lot of natural products that can be toxic too. So, or not good for your skin. Um, and our skin, you're not gonna absorb everything into your bloodstream. Our skin is designed to keep things out. And the healthier barrier is, the harder it's going to be to um, get stuff in. So what we do when I'm trying to penetrate certain products and ingredients is we use acids and retinoids to purposely disrupt the barrier so that they can penetrate into the deeper layers of the skin so they can be more effective or they can be used to help bring other active ingredients further into the skin. So things like uh, skin brighteners, peptides, growth factors, all kinds of things. So, um, so if you can imagine, uh, if you are using those anti-aging products or clarifying products like acids and the retinoids, um, you need to pay extra attention in supporting your skin at the other times, like using a barrier supportive moisturizer, um, not stripping your skin with uh, a stripping cleanser, um, and to not over exfoliate. So that, those are ways that um, you can support the skin, also the nutrition, which we'll be going after. But those are ways that you can support the skin when you are, when it's compromised due to health concerns, medications, or when we do it on purpose, like with chemical peels, light acids, or retinoids. So, oh, another thing is, is a lot of my treatments. Um, I'll start off the treatment doing a lot of things to disrupt the skin barrier on purpose. So like dermaplaning, for example, I literally razor the skin with a scalpel. We're literally ra razoring off your skin barrier. So I spend the rest of the treatment trying to penetrate nourishing ingredients back into the skin and then repairing the barrier. So that's why um, my clients tend to not get too dry after treatments because I take the barrier uh, very seriously. Um, so besides the health conditions, the products, I wanted to talk about the types of ingredients that are really common that I see with many clients walking through my doors for the first time that are showing up with impaired barriers. The majority of the time, it's a couple different types of products. The biggest one I see is 
oil heavy regimens. And not oils are not all bad. I don't hate oils. Oils have very healing and beneficial properties. They have different um, types of fatty acids, um, but not all are good for the skin topically. I've even seen oils. I've seen. I've read studies showing that they repair the barrier, but they don't talk about the other detrimental effects that those specific oils can do. And one big thing, big one, is the coconut oil. So. I am not a fan of putting coconut oil on the skin. Eating it, yes, 100% every day. But topically, it is super comedogenic. It is very high in lauric acid. And the lauric acid is what makes coconut oil uh, antibacterial and antifungal, which is awesome. But it's super duper comedogenic to a point where it is probably one of the highest rating comedogenic ingredients on the scale. It, I, the comedogenic scale is between one and four, and it's a four. So it's, it's pretty pore clogging. And I found that clients that weren't even acne prone, when they were using these oil heavy regimens with comedogenic oils, they're showing up not only with a disrupted skin barrier, but they think they have acne and they, they, they are, presenting with acne, but it doesn't mean that it's hereditary or that it's, it's hormonal. It, it could just be your products are too comedogenic for your skin. And, uh, the most that I've seen it with is with coconut oil. Um, so yeah, eat it all the way, use it on your foot fungus. Great. Don't use it on your face <laughs> and uh, on your body even. I don't recommend it. Um, so another thing I will see is clients using an oil-based serum. So it'll be like a serum. It'll say serum, but it's really oils. They'll use, okay, they'll wash their face. They'll use the oil-based serum. Then they'll use an oil-based balm as their moisturizer, because they get marketed that way as a moisturizer, even though it's just oil that's hardened, so it's a balm. Um, then they're already dehydrating their skin from water just from those first two steps. So um, after that, I find uh, a lot of popular sunscreens, tinted sunscreens, makeups, also are very oil heavy. And the reason is, is it, it's cosmetically pleasing. Oil feels so good when you first put it on. You're, you're like radiant because it's reflective. So you look radiant, you look dewy, but in a couple hours, you're not going to necessarily feel the oil anymore and you might start to get really dry. Or you'll wake up the next morning super dry again and then try and put on more of the oil and more of the balm and it's making you you're actually repeating the cycle making you more dehydrated because when you think about it oil and water don't mix alone so that's where we need other things to help them mix and those are called emulsifiers and emulsifiers are used in moisturizers so i there's a camp of skincare professionals too that are anti-emulsifier. I've been there actually. Um, and I'm back, baby. <laughs> Give me the emulsifier. There's a couple I hate, but <laughs> so I look out for those and I don't put them in my products, but I don't think all emul emulsifiers are terrible. Desert Native. Is facial dryness to the extent of peeling, is that a sign of damage barrier? Yes. Yes, it is. So sometimes though, if I put you on a product like benzoyl peroxide to help clear your acne, it is going to disrupt your barrier, but you still need it to get clear. So, you know, I have a very slow process of getting clients onto benzoyl peroxide. I don't just throw it on and expect people to, their skin to just like accept it and they're fine the next day. We, I have a whole, 
protocol, which I think I put you through, <laughs> um, desert native. <laughs> um, I think we went there together. Um, or even benzoyl peroxide alternatives. They are disruptive to the barrier. But again, that's going to go into that camp of I'm intentionally disrupting your barrier. So that's where we have to use other products to help make up for it to better support your skin. You will probably still have some levels of dryness and flakiness, but we all also have a specific purpose of getting you clear. So we have to balance that dryness by doing things that are extra hydrating and using extra hydrating, not pore clogging products. But in general, yes, facial dryness to the extent of peeling is generally a sign of a damaged barrier, unfortunately. Um, yeah, flakiness. Flakiness is not just dry. If you, you can be born a dry skin type, that, you know, that's just your skin type, uh, where your skin is just naturally kind of poreless looking, that, that tends to be a natural dry skin type. Um, dehydrated skin means that you, your natural oil production is disrupted. You would normally be producing more oil and have more water in your skin. Your barrier would be healthier, but something happened and you are dry and flaky. And so I find that those clients tend to be, um, highly sensitized. Uh, whereas a natural dry skin doesn't necessarily mean sensitive. They're just dry. So we, I, you know, in that case, certain oils mixed in a balanced way is good for dry skin types because they are naturally not producing as much oil as other people. So that's where it depends on the client. Um, and, but for you guys to know if, if you're naturally a dry skin type, or if it's your barrier, a big part is if, if it's been all your life, you've been dry, but not, not with sensitivity, um, then most likely it's not a barrier issue and kind of having small pores. That's, that's hereditary. So, um, otherwise most likely your dryness is being caused by a product, a medication, a health issue, or even the environment. So environmental causes of a messed up barrier. Pretty much every winter, I, I'd say uh, most people have experienced at one point in their life or not really, really dry, flaky, uncomfortable skin. Um, and what's literally happening is the water is evaporating out of our skin by the environment. Just like you would put water in a cup and you leave it out for a couple days and it evaporates because that's what water does. Um, so the same happens with our skin. And in that case, yes, in o certain oils can help block that water from escaping. So it can be considered good for the barrier. But if you didn't have much water to begin with and your skin was already dehydrated, that oil is trapping in the dryness and it is blocking for more water getting into your skin. So that's, that's, um, that's where I talk about balance. <laughs> I like oils in skincare mixed in to products in a balanced way and in a way that doesn't block or, uh, water from going into the skin. So if you're going to use, if there's an oil-based product, a serum, or a balm that you love, I don't want to be like, get rid of it. You know, you don't have to get rid of it, but make sure it's, if you're breaking out, check that product. Cause it could be that, um, if you're very dry still, um, I, then you are not getting enough water-based hydration. So you can still use that product, but use it at the end of your regimen. Use a water-based toner, you know, um, before use a water-based hydrating gel or serum before, then use a moisturizer, then you can pat on an oil or a balm at the end. And that way you're holding in the water. So you'd be shocked at how common I see this because oil heavy regimens are so popular. Um, 
because they are, they tend to be more natural because they're from plants and seeds. So, um, but again, that doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily be healthier for your skin barrier. And not all oils are created equal. They, again, they have different properties. So one of my favorite oils for the skin is prickly pear seed oil. And that's because it's super high in linoleic acid. And I have that in my prickly pear cleansing cream. That's why I put it in there. It is high in vitamin E. Um, it's one of the highest sources of vitamin E in, in natural ingredients, but it's also mixed in a way with the cleanser that it's going to emulsify in your skin and not block water. Um, linoleic acid is a very important part of our skin's natural moisturizing factor. Um, people with acne, rosacea, and eczema have been shown in studies to all be lacking in linoleic acid. Our skin thrives on it and it helps your skin keep inflammation under control too. So that's why I like things high in linoleic acid applied topically. I don't recommend eating it, <laughs> um, but things like sunflower seed oil, safflower seed oil, and uh, prickly pear seed oil are all very high in linoleic acid and they are not comedogenic. So they will not clog your pores or trigger acne, but they will help support your skin's barrier and inflammation if they're made in a balanced way and applied in a balanced way. So we got the products down. So too much oil, not enough water is going to disrupt your barrier. Um, the weather will disrupt your barrier. Health conditions will disrupt your barrier. Trendy skincare ingredients that tend to also be very oil or um, oil heavy or clients over exfoliating um, with trendy skincare ingredients or products that are exfoliating um, that can that's super common too. So what can we do to repair the barrier? <laughs> so now I want to go over that. In winter, when your skin is flipping dry because the air is literally sucking moisture out, um, one of my favorite things to do is use water-based hydration and then seal it in with your moisturizer. And then on top of that, you can do a non-comedogenic oil or what is my personal favorite that I feel like I've seen the best results with um, on clients is uh, Aquaphor or Vaseline. <laughs> They're the most underrated drugstore product. It is so simple. Um, it's a myth that it clogs your pores. The molecules uh, of petroleum jelly are actually too big to go into your pores. It literally just sits on top. Um, so Vaseline and petroleum jelly based products like it are amazing at holding in moisture and blocking the, the evaporation. So if you, if it's snowing and really dry where you live, you can put on a thin layer as your very last step before you go outside. And you can also put on a fine layer at night. Um, before you go to bed, it will help prevent the dehydration while you sleep. Another thing you can do is sleep with a humidifier. It get near your bed or like on your bed stand. It gets super dry where I live. I, I'm in the desert. Um, I know I have a lot of clients that might be here that are also desert dwellers and, um, you literally will go to bed and wake up with all the water hydration sucked out of your skin. So sleeping with a humidifier near your bed can help with that. Um, also just keep more moisture for, it'll keep more moisture from getting sucked out and it helps more moisture. It helps the moisturizing products in your skin to take the moisture from the air into your skin. That's what hyaluronic acid does. So maybe an oil or balm. Um, use uh, Vaseline or Aquaphor, any petroleum-based product like that. Um, the sim more simple, the better, so that way it's not mixed with other things that could potentially break you out. 
Um, oh, aquaphor over benzyl peroxide. We do not want to do that. One thing I recommend is to put on aquaphor to, on spots to block benzyl peroxide. Um, if you put it on top, uh, the point of benzyl peroxide is we want it to oxygenate. We want it to pull, push oxygen into the pore. So if you put, ben, if you put aquaphor on top of it, it's going to block that process from happening. But what does happen is sometimes we get um, really dry and dehydrated and we'll get dry patches or sometimes irritated patches from benzyl peroxide which we need to keep using. And so as a supportive measure for a couple days, you put Vaseline or Aquaphor on those dry patches um, before putting on the Aquaphor. Um, and that'll give your barrier in those spots to heal itself. So that's one thing that I do. And then it can usually tolerate, once the barrier is a little happier, it can tolerate the benzoyl peroxide a few days after that. I hope that answered your question. Oh, that was a question by Pointed Pearl Skincare, which is my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so those are some topical things that we can do to prevent moisture loss and protect your barrier in winter from the environment. The main thing you can do is use a hydrating regimen. So products with lots of things that help pull in moisture. So cleansers that are not stripping to the skin, hydrating toners, um, hydrating serums, and then balanced moisturizers. It sounds so simple, <laughs> but so many moisturizers too are just waxy residues and, and maybe an oil uh, and maybe an emulsifier, but they don't have things that are good for your barrier, good for your skin to utilize that helps it function better. Maybe just trapping out the moisture loss is not going to guarantee a good barrier. So that's why we want to support the skin as much as possible um, through products. And now one of my favorite parts is nutrition. So believe it or not, nutrition has a really big impact on skin function. And I mean, that's not surprising, I guess. Oh, desert native, the purpose of a toner. So toners were originally marketed to help rebalance your pH level because cleanse, natural soap is used to be alkaline or like bar soap or the old way of making soap. It's very alkaline and our skin is acidic. So the toner was designed to rebalance your pH to make it bring it back to being slightly acidic. Nowadays, cleansers are more pH balanced. So unless you're washing your face with hand soap uh, or bar soap, but um, most face cleansers are pH balance for your skin's barrier. It's probably slightly acidic. Um, so that way, after you wash your face, um, your skin's going to quickly, your skin's going to naturally go to its pH, uh, its slightly acidic pH on its own. It it doesn't necessarily take a product to bring it there, but it'll do it faster. So, but now with our good cleansers, it's not necessary. So what I use toners for is additional hydration. Products work better when used in damp skin, water-based products and products with humectants. So that means serums, non-oil-based serums, um, small particle serums. So serums with peptides, hyaluronic acid, um, glycerin. Glycerin is a big humectant. It's going to take the water from the toner that you used and it's going to suck it in. So you're going to use the toner. Then you're going to use a serum with those humectants or a moisturizer with those humectants. They're going to all pull that moisture into your skin. So, um, and then all the other stuff, the cholest cholesterols in the moisturizer, um, are, and fatty acids are going to mimic your natural skin barrier and help hold that water in. So that's constantly what we're trying to do is find ways to add moisture and to hold it in. Your skin naturally produces um, oils, lipids, and cholesterols, and water comes from the inside and from the outside. So, but more from the inside, and our skin is the last place to get water when we drink it. 
So if you're dehydrated, you're going to have dry skin. But if you drink excessive water in hopes that you're going to hydrate your skin more, it doesn't, it's not going to really do anything. Um, it's not going to help hydrate you more. It's, if you're not using products that are going to help hold in moisture, or if you're in an environment that sucks it out, it's, it's not going to help. You can drink all the water in the world and still have dry skin. So that's why, you know, again, balance, the balance and hydration. So, um, nutrition, <laughs> um, so these are some foods that are super good for your skin's moisture barrier. Now I am not a licensed nutritionist. I am not a doctor, but I am an expert on nutrition specifically for skin. So I just want to clarify that. So I can't, I can't make like too many health generalizations with the foods, but specifically for skin, yes. So this is my list of favorite ingredients for your barrier and why. Number one, avocados. So I'm super lucky because I live in Southern California and we have all avocados all day, every day. Um, avocados are very high in vitamin E. Um, they are, uh, also high in fatty acids, um, that your body is going to use internally to support, um, the fatty acids in your skin. So, um, the monounsaturated fatty acids specifically. So, um, that's why like eating products high in monounsaturated, monounsaturated fatty acids have been shown to improve skin. So that's also includes olive oil, eating it, not, not putting it on your skin. Same with avocado, eating it, not putting it on your skin. Um, so vitamin E helps protect your skin uh, against the environment. It's a very powerful antioxidant and eating avocado helps um, somehow get to your skin. I don't know the exact process, but um, eating a lot of vitamin E uh, in a very bioavailable way, like in avocado, is going to get benefits in your skin. And it has been proven by research done at UCLA that people who eat one avocado a day um, have increased moisture and less fine lines and wrinkles <laughs> and increased collagen production. So I'm like, I, I eat an avocado a day anyways, just because they're delicious. <laughs> and I live in avocado land, uh, Southern California. It was just like San Diego has tons of avocado trees. Um, but yeah, so we, we, get, we get a lot of avocado. Yeah, you want to eat that every day. One avocado a day is what was in the study. Um, doesn't mean you have to eat too much avocado. Anyways, avocado, number two, um, eggs. So eggs are nature's multivitamins. They are high in cholesterol, which has been demonized by many health institutions. But actually when I learned um, from one of my uh, very, one of my favorite teachers who is a nutritionist for the skin and health, um, she basically broke down what cells are made of and the membranes of cells are cholesterol. Cholesterol is necessary for cellular function without cholesterol. You won't just be having a, a skin problem. You'll be having other problems too, health problems. Um, so we need cholesterol for our cells to function properly and eggs are high in that along with a ton of essential vitamins, amino acids, which is the proteins, and vitamin K. Vitamin K is responsible for um, the health of our capillaries. So if you don't, so things like puffiness around the eyes, dark circles, that's from stagnant blood, um, capillary action, and not enough lymph too, but it's it's also capillary health. So vitamin K is very high in eggs and very good for capillaries. Um, and also lutein. Eggs are super high in lutein, um, which is also good for skin hydration. 
Um, what else? Oh yeah, and phospholipids. That's all, again, all cells are made of cholesterol and phospholipids, um, and eggs are high in both. So that mimics everything that your cells need to basically thrive. So eggs are, are awesome for your skin. Um, my other favorite thing is cold water fish. And also, I'm, my family's originally from Eastern Europe, so I grew up with a lot of cold water fish products, but also red caviar. It was like the poor man's caviar. You know, my dad used to go to the um, market and like get like a tub like this big of red caviar and we would just like scoop it on everything for weeks. So um, yeah, red caviar is my personal favorite way to get omega-3. So the cold water fish is like mackerel, sardines, herring. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of salmon anymore unless it's wild caught. But even then, I, I still feel it's, it's too fatty. Um, I really prefer for, for the skin, um, mackerel, sardines, and herring. Those are, those are pretty great. Um, and I read a really disturbing study, too, that showed that 68% uh, of adults in the United States and 95% of children, 95% of American children are deficient in omega-3. This is crazy, like that's a big deficiency. So, um, and most likely it's due to dietary nature. It's, you know, my family, I'm fortunate to come from a background that it was culturally normal to eat lots of cold fish things. It is just not like that in America. Um, you know, when I was growing up, kids used to flip out over my lunches, <laughs> you know, things like pickled fish <laughs> and red caviar on rye bread was just like crazy to the other kids at, at school. So I can only imagine that probably also means they're not eating things that have enough omega-3 for function. So there's a large, um, deficiency throughout the country. So I mean, it's just great. 68% of adults and 95% of children. So why is omega-3 so important for our skin? Well, we're going to go back to the ceramides that like that glue, that mortar in between the bricks um, that's holding everything together and holding in the moisture too, um, that we have a harder time to produce as we age. Um, so ceramides are responsible for, uh, sorry, omega-3 helps your body to produce its own ceramides. So that way it is your skin, you, if you eat enough omega-3, that's giving that cellular structure the support it needs to work better. So you're going to have a strong glue, that strong brick and mortar glue in between the bricks. So... Um, omega-3 is how you're going to naturally get stimulate ceramides in yourself. So also omega-3 is responsible for inflammatory processes, controlling inflammation in the body and in the skin. So that's why if, if you cannot eat fish, um, if it's just disgusting <laughs> to you, um, or you're, well, not if you're allergic, but if, if it's just repulsive to you, then I recommend supplementing then in an omega-3 supplement daily. And my favorite one is cod liver oil. I know it sounds disgusting. <laughs> it's, it's not tasty. You just get, I get the plainest one that has no flavor and it doesn't smell fishy. It's just a teaspoon every day. You can do that. Um, and if you're vegan, um, uh, I hate to say I have a large base of vegan friends that I grew up with. I was vegan growing up. Um, I am not hating on you guys. And I say this all the time because I always feel guilty for attacking the vegans. But um, y'all are omega-3 deficient <laughs> because there's not a lot of omega-3 that is very bioavailable in plant-based form. 
So there are newer things that I recommend um, any vegan or vegetarian clients to come. I still, it's not a cure. It's not enough, honestly, um, but it does help to take a, a vegan omega-3 supplement. And then there's typically two kinds. One is um, algae-based and the other one is ahi flower-based. The algae one is very popular. I'd say it's probably more popular, but algae can be a huge acne trigger. So, and if you're already omega-3 deficient, your barrier is going to have issues and you may be more breakout prone while being dry and inflamed. So I don't recommend the algae version. I recommend the ahi flour for vegans. So supplement with ahi flour oil if you are vegan. That's the best you can do and you need it. Um, and I've seen, I've seen changes within a week or two of vegan clients supplementing it. So in their skin. So if, if you're vegan and you're running dry, all the time, that's why. <laughs> Not enough omega-3, so ahi flower oil. Um, next, marine collagen. I love marine collagen. Collagen is super popular now. You know, there's the whole like bone broth and keto trends, ways of eating and whatnot. And um, a lot of those people are um, talking about uh, collagen peptides, the powders and supplements and drinks, helping with um, all kinds of things, but mostly you see advertised for fine lines, wrinkles, and skin elasticity. Um, to be honest, what those collagen powders are, are just amino acids. So they're just protein. Um, most women in the United States, I don't know about other countries, but just it's based off of studies I read again too, um, are under eating protein. Um, and it just like the omega threes is just, we just don't eat enough protein in general for our body weight. Um, and that can cause bone density issues and all kinds of other health stuff. So for the health stuff, I would say collagen from beef, the, the collagen supplements that you see all the time is probably going to be very helpful. There's also different types of collagen. So um, I think one, one, two, three, four, five, different kinds of collagen. So the beef collagen is going to help with a couple kinds and the marine collagen helps with a couple different kinds. So I'd say for your body, use the beef-based collagen. For your skin specifically, there has been shown to have better benefits with marine collagen. And I actually just recently read a Korean study that shows that um, taking Korean, uh, marine collagen daily creates an increase in skin moisture and ceramides and natural moisturizing factors. So that's just like pure barrier boost. Um, also, they help, it helps with inflammation in the skin. So um, people with redness conditions, um, are going to really benefit from marine collagen. So um, marine collagen um, as a supplement, I don't know about all the different forms of it. The way that I recommend taking it, just so that I consume it more frequently, is in the cheapest way that I found. It is like a tub of the unflavored powder. And it doesn't tend to have a taste or a fishy smell. And that way, since it tastes like nothing, I can mix it in my coffee or juice. And that way you can get it in every day. Um, I found that the flavored ones, supplements, tend to have a lot of weird additives and stuff that I'm just not a fan of anymore. I'd rather just have the pure stuff in my coffee. So yeah, marine collagen. Um, and then the last food I will go over uh, is vitamin C foods, foods that are high in vitamin C. Our skin uses vitamin C very seriously. It is important for our wound healing processes and is also used for building collagen. So um, eating vitamin C with a protein rich diet like collagen um, and lots of fish uh, and eggs 
is going to work together to help your skin to heal better, wound healing, and to produce new collagen and elastin. So um, that means better elasticity. So eating foods daily, high in vitamin C, um, and it doesn't matter what, I, I usually do, I don't know, I drink orange juice when it's in season, I eat strawberries when they're in season, and bell peppers. I, I read that I think even potatoes have a lot of vitamin C. So however you get it in, just get it in. But um, yeah, that's that's one of my last favorite um, uh, ingredient nutritionally for skin barrier health. So avocados. Oh, I'm going to make a post about this actually tomorrow. I'm going to make like a a layout, an uh, infographic, that's what they're called these days. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna post an infographic that I made that um, lists the nutrition. So um, you guys can have that tomorrow on my Instagram. Um, so that's it. That pretty much concludes my presentation on all things skin barrier. Uh, does anybody have any questions before I talk about next week? <laughs> Just put it in the comments. There's a little bit of a delay, I know that too, but. No? All right, no questions. That means I covered everything good, huh? <laughs> so next week, since I'm going to be going live every Wednesday at seven, um, oh, pointed pearl. Not a fan of the Barleen's cream fish oil anymore. Ah, you know, I, I still recommend it because people are going to be more likely to take it. It's a flavored fish oil. Um, I don't like the artificial sweeteners in it. I think xylitol. Um, that can cause digestive problems for some people. And and um, so it's it's mostly that. But if people are really adverse to taking fish oil... Um, it really disgusts them and liquid is always better. It's going to digest better. Um, then I, I would definitely recommend the Barleen still. It's going to be better than being omega-3 deficient. So, um, my main recommendation is cod liver oil, but not if you're acne prone, because it can, it can break you out too. If you're not acne prone, um, and especially if you're postmenopausal, cod liver oil is going to be your best friend. Um, my masks do assist with the skin barrier. Um, my masks are extremely hydrating and they have marine collagen in them <laughs> too. And all kinds of other, they have phospholipids too in them. So, and ceramides. So my masks contain many hydrating things and many barrier boosting things. All my moisturizers are also either high in linoleic acid um, or they contain ceramides. So, or, or I'm sorry, ceramide boosting ingredients, um, like the, sorry, ceramides or high linoleic acid, which helps boost the ceramides. That's what I meant. So I take barrier repair very serious. Um, next week, I'm going to be going over a really simple, uh, time hacks for skincare for people with no time, because I feel like being an esthetician for the past almost 14 years, um, I do a lot on my skin and I found a lot of ways to get it, get the skin care in <laughs> when you don't have a lot of time. And I have, I don't have children, but I have a very chaotic timed life for somebody without children. So I can only imagine even people with children, um, are so time poor. So I'm going to help you get everything in. Oh, how many masks would you recommend a week? Um, you can do it every day if you want to. It's not going to bother your skin. But I recommend um, in a realistic way for time and finances, once a week is going to make a good difference. But you can do it as much as you want. It's not going to cause any issues. It's just going to be beneficial. I think in Korea, um, people sheet mask daily on the regular. Props to them, though, because, yeah, flawless.